morning. This morning we come to learn about a spiritual discipline that most people in our times know very little about. It is the discipline of fasting. Most people only know about fasting when they get a call from their doctor and they need a blood test and the doctor says you need to fast for 12 hours and they say, 12 hours? You mean I, I can't have any food from 8 at night till 8 in the morning? How am I going to survive? In Jesus' day, though, <laughs> in Jesus' day, though, fasting by religious people was a common occurrence. Most of the Pharisees fasted at least two times a week. So what is fasting? Fasting, in a biblical context, in a, in a Christian context, fasting is only eating spiritual food for the day. Only eating spiritual food for the day. That means not eating regular physical food. While this spiritual discipline is admirable, there's also a danger of pride that can go along with it. So Jesus picks up where he left off in verses 2 to 8. Let's look back there again in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 2. It says, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, and so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And then verse 5, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then He gives the disciples prayer. And then down here at verse 16, it says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. You see a pattern here, right? Jesus doesn't like hypocrites. Okay, He doesn't want us to be hypocrites. He says, when you fast... Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting may be seen by others. You know what that means? Oh, I'm fasting. <sighs> All right? So people can see that, okay? And truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So first he warns us not to do our acts of righteousness before men in giving. And then he warns us not to pray in front of other people for the sake of being seen. And then here he says when we fast we should do so secretly and not announce it. God desires worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth, not in show and in hypocrisy. So may the Lord open our eyes to see the snares of the evil one and the benefit of the discipline of fasting today. Let's pray. Oh Lord, you know the hearts of every single person in here and you know how we live our lives and, and you know whether our hearts are focused on you or not. And so I, I pray that you would turn our hearts to you now, Lord. Help us to learn what you have to tell us about fasting, the benefits of fasting. And I pray that you would even grant us a heart that is willing to fast in secret for the purpose of focusing on you. Oh Lord, this is a spiritual discipline and no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. And so, uh, Lord, I pray that you would give us the ability to actually do this, that it would be something which is a part of our Christian lives, not as some legalistic practice, but because of our love for you. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you that they come here wanting to hear the word of God preached, that they know that the word is the only thing which can penetrate their hearts. I thank you that they're so patient with me as I preach it, that they really desire it, and so I pray now, Lord, that you would speak through me. Help me only to say what you want me to say. 
Help your people to hear what you would have them hear in this sermon on your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to be looking at verses 16 to 18 today. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So you'll notice something that Jesus says here in verse 16. He says, when you fast... He doesn't say, if you fast. Now, he seems to expect that Christians, his disciples, will have fasting as a part of their spiritual lives. The Puritans called it uh, soul-fattening fasting. That's what they called fasting, soul-fattening fasting. They saw that when they fast, their souls get fat, they're nourished. And fasting is something which actually, uh, when done in a, a biblical way, in a God-honoring way, it's something which is really beneficial to our souls. And since this is the case, it would be good to understand some of the biblical precedent for, for fasting, why people fast from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Interestingly, even though the Bible talks quite a bit about fasting and records many instances of it, fasting is only commanded by God on one day a year. Does anyone know what that day is? Yom Kippur, that's right, which actually was this last week, if you guys know the Jewish calendar. This last week was Yom Kippur. That's the only day in the Bible where God commands his nation, Israel, to fast, the Day of Atonement. All Israel was to abstain on that day from food and to deny themselves. And you see that language other places, especially in the New Testament, about denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following Jesus. Even though Yom Kippur is the only commanded day, many believers in the Old Testament fasted, including Moses and Samson and Samuel and David and Elijah and many others. And the Old Testament context for fasting was for mourning and repenting of sin, people would fast. Or if a national disaster took place, um, people fasted, okay? Like when Saul and his son Jonathan were killed, in battle by the Philistines, the men of Jabesh Gilead, it says, uh, buried them and then fasted for seven days. 1 Samuel chapter 3, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 31, verse 13, and we'll see why they did that in a little bit. Well, remember the story of Jonah. Uh, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach against Nineveh's wickedness, and so Jonah went there and proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. And so what was the Ninevites' reaction. It says the Ninevites, in Jonah 3, 5, the Ninevites believed God and they declared a fast and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. Okay, some of the Old Testament instances of doing this practice, but we also see it in the New Testament as well. We see Christians fasting in the New Testament in order to get clear direction from God as they waited for God to reveal His will. Paul's missionary journeys were connected with fasting. If you would turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, verses 2 to 3. Acts 13, 2 to 3 says this, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Okay, so this is Acts. This is the New Testament. This is the church, the early church. The book of Acts is the the proto-church, okay? And so if they fasted and prayed, and that was something which is a part of the early church, then isn't it strange that Well, the church today, we don't really hear that much about it. I mean, how many times has our church, Crossview Church, for those of you who have been going here for, you know, 40 years, I know there's only a few of you who have, how many times has the church declared a fast? Has that ever happened? Zero zero times, someone just told me. (laughs) All right? Zero times. That's sort of interesting, isn't it? Because it's a part of the church... It's a spiritual discipline. Jesus says, when you fast, 
Don't be like the hypocrites. He expects fasting from his people. You guys want to do a fast? Oh, I'm totally serious. <laughs> Maybe we should. You know, not as some legalistic thing where, well, pastor says if we're a good Christian, we need to do it today. Like, no, all right? No, I'm not commanding you you have to do it, but, but it seems like Jesus expects that from his church. It's, it's just an expectation. He says to his disciples, not in the Old Testament, the New Testament, when you fast, don't be like them. We're going to see something else in Luke later on when the Pharisees and others were, were saying like, well, you know, these other people fast. How come you guys don't fast? And then Jesus explains why in that moment they weren't, but that they will, that the church will fast. Okay, I'm going to give you your assignment at the end of the sermon, okay? All right. Jesus describes appropriate fasting in Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 33. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. Okay, just keep that in mind for a moment. When fasting is done for the right reasons... It does three things primarily. First, it makes us see our dependence upon God, which in turn strengthens our prayers. When we fast, we see our dependence upon God because as we're fasting, as we're denying ourselves food, even if it's just for 24 hours, your stomach starts to rumble. You start to realize, man, I really need food. You know, when we're stuffing our face every two hours, when we can go to the store if we're hungry, or we can open the fridge when we're hungry, and we just eat, you know, and it's just something instant gratification, you know? We just have it right there. You know, we have a frozen pizza in the fridge, and we can just cook it right now. We have whatever, snacks, bags of chips, they're all there. Then, you know, really our dependence upon God is sort of taken for granted. I mean, I mean, I mean uh, this kind of food and all of that is taken for granted. We don't realize how much we really depend on God for our sustenance, for our daily needs. Until those things are taken away from us. You know that phrase, um, you don't know what you have until it's gone? People, the culture sort of uses that um, you know, for relationships and like, oh, you treat the person so bad and they break up with you. Oh, I didn't know what I had until it was gone, right? Well, the same thing can be applied to food. We don't really realize, especially here, I think in other cultures, they understand it a little bit more so that when they pray, give us this day our daily bread, they really mean it, you know? They really mean, Lord, I really need you to provide bread for me. I'm really dependent upon you, Lord. But here, in this land of plenty and abundance, we can just get it like nothing. We can just go into the store. I mean, Jewel's right down the block. I could fill the whole grocery cart. Fasting makes us see our dependence upon God. And when we see our dependence upon God, as our stomach is rumbling and we're 10 hours into a fast, then when we pray to the Lord, we can pray with a renewed sense of dependence upon him and say, Lord, I'm so hungry right now. I didn't even realize before how you provide for me so much. You provide for me, and I just take it for granted. I eat it. I hardly even say thank you. I'll mumble a prayer like, Lord, thank you so much for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. Right? I mean, don't we do it if we even do that at all? If we even do that? There have been times where I'll have like a hot pocket, you know, and I'll put the hot pocket in the microwave and I'll set it for 45 seconds and I'll take the hot pocket out and then I'm not even thinking and I'll just like take it out and unwrap it, I'll bite and I'm chewing it and then I realize, where's my dependence upon God right now? And I will take that bite and spit it in the garbage. How dare I eat without recognizing how my dependence upon God is a daily thing. 
how much I need him, how much he has provided for me. How dare I ever take one more bite without realizing that? Spit out your food if you ever realize, I have not thanked God for this. Spit it out. Fasting cultivates our dependence upon, a recognition of our dependence upon God. Secondly, it cultivates gratitude for the Lord's provision because when we see our dependence upon God, then we're grateful for how he's provided for us. When we fast, we become grateful. Grateful people. People who say, thank you, Lord. Be thankful always. How can we be thankful for things that are just come so naturally to us? It's, it's, it's really difficult then. It's really difficult to, to honestly, from our hearts, when we're st- always stuffing our faces, to say, Lord, this is beyond great what you're giving to me, Lord. It's grace upon grace that I could eat this delicious food. You give this. I'm so thankful to you. See, when we deny that, when we even just take one day, not even a day, when we take one meal even, one meal, doesn't the next meal taste that much better? I mean, think about this for a second. Haven't there been times where you're like seriously hungry, okay? You haven't, for whatever reason, you're super, super hungry, okay? And then you go and you get McDonald's and you stick a fry in your mouth And you're like, these fries are the best tasting fries I've ever had. And your spouse says, no, they're not. It's just because you're hungry. (laughs) Right? You know what I'm talking about? It makes it taste better. It makes everything taste better. If you fasted, then you're so hungry and you're real, like eating it. It's like, oh, I'm so grateful for this. I can actually taste the food. That's what fasting does. Fasting sharpens our focus on God. It sharpens our focus on God. Because our eyes are so set on this world. Fasting sharpens our focus on God and it weans us from the world. We're so attached to it, you know. We were just reading... um, Thomas Boston's Human Nature and Its Fourfold State, which is a difficult book, but a, a wonderful book written by this um, 18th century Puritan. And, and uh, Boston talks about John chapter 9. Remember John chapter 9? It's one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible where they, Jesus and the disciples come upon a man who is born blind. And the disciples say, you know, who sinned, this man or his parents? And he was born blind, and he, Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happens so that the glory of God will be revealed in his life. And then he goes up to the man, and he spits on the ground, and he makes mud out of the earth, and then sticks the mud on the man's face, on his eyes, which is like gross. And, and I, I've always looked at that as like, um, well, sure, what Jesus is doing there in that moment is what God did in Genesis when he made man from the dust of the earth. God, the Lord God, Jesus Christ, took earth and put it on the man's eyes and recreated eyes for him. And that's always been the way that I've seen that passage. And it's, it's beautiful. And I think that that's actually true, a right interpretation of that passage. But then Boston went even deeper in, 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 into a, a different aspect of it. And what he said is, why earth? Why did he cover the man's eyes with earth? And the disciples saw it. He spit on the ground. He made earth with it and covered his eyes. And then he told the man, go to Salome and wash the earth off. And then he even designates, Salome means sent, right? Just like Jesus was sent to us. Why did he do that? It's because our eyes are filled with earth. Our eyes are filled with the earth. The disciples' eyes, even at that moment, were filled with the earth. They are only focused on the earth. And Jesus wants us to focus on him, to take our eyes off of the earth, take our eyes off of the things that the earth gives us, and focus on the one who gives them to us. Brilliant. Like, That's one of those mind-blowing moments as I was reading Boston and I realized, yes, yes, that's exactly right. 
The disciples couldn't see, they couldn't understand. And the man goes to the pool and he washes the earth off of his eyes. That's what fasting does for us. It washes the earth out of our eyes. Weans us from the earth. Takes us, our focus off of the earth and puts it on the Lord. This is countercultural, okay? Fasting is countercultural because the world says, what is the, the primary motto of the world? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. That's it. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. But Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The world says, indulge all your appetites. Envy, lust, gluttony are the fuel that our country runs on. But Jesus says, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. The world says, this universe and this world is all there ever was and all there ever will be, so you need to fill yourself with it. But in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 9, it says this. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Now you remember what we just learned from Matthew, I'm sorry, from Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and they, qu they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers and the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. So what is he talking about? Okay. There is an eschatological element to fasting. There is an end of the world element to fasting. When we fast, we realize this world is not our home. That's what we're saying as we're fasting. This world is not my home. I live on more than just bread alone. I live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I have spiritual food that the world does not know about. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 4 as he's talking to his disciples and he's talking to the Samaritan woman and they're like, you know, we brought this food back and here he is talking to this woman and like, what are you doing, Lord? Like, aren't you hungry? And Jesus says, I have food to eat that you do not know about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Wow. When we fast, we're eating that food. And you know, I, I think I was just talking to my brother today, right before this service, and, and he was like, you know, I think a lot of people misunderstand fasting, that, that it's just something which has, always has to be planned out, and you know, you've got to do it at this time and in this way, and, and I don't think so. I don't think necessarily that, you know, Jesus planned out a fast time in John chapter 4. It was that he was already doing the work of God so much and being sustained by doing the work of God that he forgot about food. It wasn't even on his mind. He was eating spiritual food in that moment. He was so consumed with doing the work of God, like, wow, I haven't even eaten in 10 hours. I didn't even realize it. I'm not even hungry because I'm doing God's work. And when we fast, we're recognizing this world is not my home. There's coming a day when I will never be hungry again for physical food at all. I'll never be hungry because I will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know it's called that, the supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because we're going to eat there, you know. People ask, oh, is there going to be food in heaven? Yes, there will be food in heaven. Yes, the Bible talks so much about that. We'll eat from the tree of life. Well, Jesus tells the disciples, I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it with you anew in the kingdom. Will there be wine in heaven? Yes. Yes. I think too often we spiritualize those things and, and think that in heaven all we're going to do is play harps and be on the clouds. But you know, the, the, the Bible is, talks about a reality that's much deeper than that. 
There will be a resurrection of our bodies. We'll have new bodies and our, our body and our soul will be joined together and we will actually eat. We will eat in heaven. We will drink in heaven. And so when we fast, there's sort of an eschatological element to it where we're looking forward to this time when all will be satisfied. All of my yearnings and my hunger will be satisfied by Jesus Christ. And I hunger now. And then when we're 24 hours in, you feel really hungry in that moment. You know, you're 24 hours into the fast. You feel really, really hungry. But that feeling right here in the pit of your stomach, that acid reflux that you maybe get because you haven't eaten in a long time, all that really serves to do is to point us forward to a time when we will never, ever feel that again. This world is not our home. Fasting is thus appropriate then in times of sorrow. When, his, when David's son was ill, he fasted. He fasted. Why? Because he wanted to focus on God, to wean himself from the world, to see his dependence upon God, to cultivate gratitude for the Lord's provision. In times of danger, Israel fasted. In times of mourning, they fasted. They fasted over sin, and they fasted to seek God's will, because when we fast, it takes away that. When we're stuffing our face, that, that sort of carnal, fleshly desire that so consumes us, especially where we live now, we have this, we, I mean, you know, we, we don't even realize it. You know what's an amazing thing, actually? I mean, America's a first world nation. We're the definition of a first world nation. At least now we are, you know. But there's some other first world nations out there. Can you think of, like, maybe the next to America, the, the first world nation that's probably next to America, you know, that has the amenities and the... the kind of hospitals and all of those kinds of things that America maybe has. What would be the next country next to America that would have that? Maybe England? You know, maybe Israel, sure. You know, but I've never been there. <laughs> Y'all want to go to Israel? That would be fun. Um, I mean, I think of England. I mean, we come from England, <laughs> you know. England used to rule over us. We're basically English, many of us, all right? I went to England just a few months ago, and I went into their uh, supermarket, and I was sort of astounded at how much fewer the choices are in English supermarkets than they are here in America. Isn't that amazing? England, it's England. They have billions and billions of dollars, and the, they're super rich and all of that. They still have far less choices than we do. We, we take it so much for granted. I was in the supermarket just the other day and just looking at the cereal aisle. Wow! I watched this documentary on Netflix about a, a tribe that, um, that was in the Amazon. It was the Lost Amazon Tribes or something. I think that was, that's what it, the documentary is called. This guy went in there. It wasn't a Christian documentary. He just went in there as, as a, a scientist to study them and um, an anthropologist. And they came out. This is a tribe that had never seen civilization. And they came out with spears and they were naked. And there was real danger there because, you know, these tribes, they'll like kill easily, quickly. They don't care. And, uh, and they were trying to talk and, and communicate with them. And, and months went by and then they they sanitized some clothing, and they gave the tribe clothing. And then they interviewed this tribe later on, and they said, would you rather have clothing or be naked? And every person in the tribe was like, wow, clothes are so great. This is wonderful. I can't believe you guys had clothes all this time, and we've been naked the whole time. I really like clothes, okay? Really. And I really like having food that I don't have to hunt for all the time. Wow, this is amazing. And you know they have one set of clothes. One set. And the food they have is, well, half of an aisle of the jewel down the street. 
is way, way more than they have. And they're like, wow, this is so wonderful. We could never go back to how we used to live because we have such abundance. Incredible. We have feet that have shoes on them now. Wow. That's the reason why Jesus says um, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Because we're so stupidly rich that it's easy for us not to acknowledge God at all. Just to just take it all for granted. If anyone in the world needs to fast... It's us. We need to fast. We need to see our dependence upon God. So we see fasting in the Bible. It's common. But it had been perverted by the time uh, of Jesus in at least two ways. It had become a ritual to gain praise from others. Many religious leaders fasted on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, partly because those were the market days when people would be out and about to see their fasting. They would put on old clothes and they would mess up their hair and they would wear these grimaces that said, oh, this fasting is so hard, but it's my duty to God. Did, did you hear that rumble? That was my stomach. Yeah, it's because I'm fasting, okay? What a sham. What a a mockery. I mean, if if fasting cultivates gratitude for the Lord's provision, makes us see our dependence upon God, sharpens our focus upon God, is really God-centered thing, then what a sham and a mockery it is to fast for the purpose of being seen while doing it. To announce, to like type out like, hey everyone, (laughs) so with Tenno's hungry right now, I've been fasting. Put that on the Facebook Boy, that defeats the purpose. Jesus says they already got their reward then. Oh, Rabbi, you're so holy. You're such a holy man. I wish I could fast like that. Jesus said that's all the reward they would get because their heart, in their heart, they were hypocrites. God wants true worship. He wants true devotion and true service. And he doesn't want phonies. If that's anything that we could learn from just, you know, the last 18 verses in Matthew 6 is that God doesn't want phonies. If this church is anything, I really hope that it's honest disciples, honest lovers of Jesus. Even when we fail, even when we sin, we repent and we turn back to the Lord, the last thing that our church should be are hypocrites. Those who put on a smile on the outside and pretend like everything's okay and pretend like they're doing good and they, you know, and really it's not. Or who do their righteous acts just to be seen by others in the church. God forbid. So fasting had become a ritual in that time. I think even now fasting can be a ritual today. And it also become a practice, a sort of formula to gain God's approval. In Luke chapter 18, you remember there, were the, there was a Pharisee and a tax collector, and a Pharisee said, Oh Lord, I tie the tenth of all that I get, and I fast twice a week. As if by fasting they were doing something which would um, engender the, the, the admiration of God or, or somehow make them righteous before the Lord, but Jesus says that uh, no, only one of them went away justified. Don't many people do the same things today? In our pride, we think we can somehow earn our way into God's favor. But when believers fast or do really any service for God, we are to do it for God. Look at verses 17 to 18. It says, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. I think that how a Christian lives in secret says a lot about them. What we do when God sees us and only God sees us is really who we truly are. 
Jesus says that when we fast, we are to do it in secret. And because that way, it ensures that we do it by faith. If it's in secret, we have to have faith. Now think about that for a second. If we do our righteous acts in secret, purposely keep them a secret and never tell anybody about them, then that necessitates faith, right? Because we're doing it by secret, having faith that God is watching me right now. That I'm in the presence of the Lord every day. That God is with me. He sees it. I don't have to tell anybody about it. He knows about it. See? Doing it in secret necessitates faith. Indeed, when we fast, we say to the Lord, I'm just going to rely on you today, God. Take away all my distractions, even the distraction of food, so that I can seek your face and commune with you. May my fellowship with you be my food today. Amen. And this can be hard. It's hard to do that because we have an animal nature that really wants food. We desire it. It's something that's a part of us. We, we're built with that desire. Our stomach rumbles because we're hungry. It's inside of us. And so it's a discipline like prayer and giving. All of those are disciplines. And all of fasting and prayer and giving remind us of a primary relationship which is God and us. All three require that we give up something to gain something better. We're giving up food today so that I can gain something even better than food. The first time you voluntarily give up the pleasure of food, it may hurt. It may hurt. It will hurt. And I know that some of you who have medical conditions, it's just impossible for you to do so because then you'll just die. All right? I, don't, I, don't, I want you to live. You, know, you, you don't have to... Fast then, maybe you can skip one meal, and that's it then. I don't know. But if you do it for the Lord, you will be rewarded, even though it hurts. Hebrews 12, 11 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Think about the discipline that Jesus had when he fasted for 40 days. Just think about that for a second. What kind of discipline that is. And we think, oh, well, because he's Jesus. You know, he's Jesus. And so he can do it. He can do, he's God. Oh, do, you, do you understand that Jesus, yes, he's 100% God, but he's also 100% human? He has a human nature. And that human nature, as, as difficult as it is for a person to fast for one day, he's fasted for 40 days, it's Truly, almost miraculous that he didn't die while he's fasting. I mean, sci I think we talked about this before at some, in, in some sermon. I, I said, you know, scientists say you can go like three weeks, maybe four weeks without food. That's four weeks. It's like maybe 30 days. 40 days, though, Jesus went. Incredible. Think about how thin he was after that. How much weight he lost. But because he did that, even though he was physically weak, his spirit was prepared to fight off the devil's temptations. Richard Foster, in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, says, The first time you fast, start with just one meal. Just fast for one meal. Treat fasting like an exercise. If you're a novice, don't try to swim the English Channel. During your fast, pray often. Be sure not to make things... Uh, Make this thing a big public event, okay? Don't tell your friends. Don't moan to your family about hunger pangs. Just pray. You can pray to God and say, Lord, I'm so hungry right now. And the Twinkie is calling my name. I see it. It's calling me. I'm going to fast for you, Lord. Tell the Lord how much you want His love and guidance. Let your fast bring you joy. You can actually choose that. I think joy is a choice. So many times it's a choice. You choose to be happy. Fasting is a way to have fellowship with Jesus by sharing in a small way in His sufferings. In Philippians um, chapter 3, verses 8-11, to 11, the Apostle Paul writes, Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Everything is a loss, even his food. 
For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Do you know, if you fasted for a long time, if you fasted even two days, you start to think, you start to think, maybe I could die. <laughs> maybe I could die. Oh, I want to be like you, Jesus. I want to share in your sufferings, however small it is. When we choose to go without food, we're choosing in this tiny little sliver of a way to suffer with Christ. Say, Lord, you went without food. How hungry were you, Lord, in the desert? So hungry. I want to experience just some small taste of that hunger so that I may know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in your sufferings, becoming like you in your death, to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Why? Because we have this eschatological focus as we're doing so because we realize that, you know what, there's coming a day when I'll never have to experience this kind of hunger ever again. Never. Jesus said that he's the true bread from heaven, that whoever eats of that bread will never hunger and will never thirst. So when we fast... We're basically eating the bread of Jesus. We're saying, I want you today. You're going to be my sustenance for the day, Lord. Remember Martha and Mary? I'm going to close with this. Remember Martha and Mary uh, in Luke chapter 10? In Luke chapter 10, uh, starting at verse 38, it says, Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to serve alone? Tell her to come and help me. <laughs> you know, we need Martha's, and we need Mary's too in the church. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. She chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. She chose to make Jesus her focus. This food is going out. She's ignoring the food because she's being fed by the Lord. Spiritual food. I can almost imagine Mary sitting there enraptured by the Lord as the Lord is speaking to her and she's receiving it. She can't even focus on anything else. It's not that Mary is, uh, you know, lazy. She would help her sister, certainly. And her sister thinks that as she's looking at Mary, as Martha's looking at her. Oh, she's just being lazy right now. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus, just listening. Come on, there's a lot of work to be done, Mary. There's all this food. We have to serve it. We've got to eat it. We've got to do this and that and this and that. Distracted by many things. Mary can't even hear her. She's so focused on the Lord, she can't even hear her sister. I mean, her sister is the most important person to her in the world outside of Jesus. She loves her sister. She loves her brother Lazarus. There's such a Close, tight-knit family. They're weeping, remember, when Lazarus dies. They love their, their family is really important to them, okay? This is a really important family in the New Testament. They're talked about a lot. They're best friends with Jesus, okay? But in this moment, Martha was in the wrong, and Mary was in the right. Martha needed to set her stuff down and come and sit at the feet of Jesus, not be focused on the food, not be focused on the serving, not be focused on anything else but him. Jesus said, Mary has chosen the good portion. Look at that. Even, even that phrasing, the good portion. See, there's all these portions of food. There's the, the rack of lamb is sitting out there and the bread and the wine and the oil and it's so delicious and you can smell it. Mary can't even smell it. 
She's focused on Jesus. She's fasting and she doesn't even realize it. She's so focused, she doesn't even think about her hunger. She's just thinking about the Lord. Listening to what he has to say. Listening to his words. Spending time in the word. I mean, in that moment, literally, he's spending time with the word. The word is with her, sitting there, saying, Mary, I know you. I love you. Here's what I have to say to you today. I don't even know what he was talking to her about. The Bible doesn't record it. It was something so enrapturing to her soul, she couldn't do anything else but sit there. She would have sat there for a million years. Sometimes we need to be like Martha. Sometimes we need to be like Mary. Just put it down and be with Jesus for the day. Okay, so, I want to challenge this church. I want to challenge the church to skip at least a meal, to do so for Jesus, okay? To skip a meal. Let's set a day. Let's set a day. Now, I'm sort of going against the passage right now because then everyone will know that everyone else is fasting, okay? So I'm only saying this one time so that we can spur one another on and help each other so that we can get a pattern started of actually fasting, you know? I mean, we can fast in secret after this time, but I think it would be good for us. I think it would be really good for us to do so, to just skip one meal as a church, to declare a fast, and at that time, oh, isn't this a good time for us to fast and pray right now as our country is going before an election that's so, oh my goodness, we don't know what's going to happen with the, the, the future. What's going to happen? Well, the future is in God's hands. That we would focus on the Lord, that we would pray, God, I'm going to take away this food right now and spend this time just with you so that I could pray for our country. I could pray for our church. I could pray for people that I love who don't know you. Spend that time, just one meal, praying, re reading the Bible, listening to, to Jesus like Mary did. Now, I was going to say, what's a good day for you? No, I'm not going to say that now, all right? Because it, it shouldn't be a good day for you. This is discipline. It's hard, all right? How about Tuesday? Is that a good day for you? I don't care if it is. <laughs> How about this Tuesday plan on skipping one meal for Jesus? Just spending that time in the Word. I'm not even going to follow up with you and ask you about it. If you do it, do it. If you don't, that's okay too. This is not a legalism, okay? I'm not saying you have to do this or you're not a Christian or anything. Nothing like that. But we need to get in the habit of fasting. That's why Jesus tells us to do it, okay? This Tuesday, let's skip one meal for Jesus. I won't be able to check up on you. It's going to be in secret, but let's do it. And may God bless us as we do. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I'm so thankful that Jesus is the bread from heaven that you are truly the one who satisfies our souls, that no amount of food or filling ourselves with anything else can ever truly satisfy us, but only you, Lord. I pray that we would find our satisfaction in Jesus Christ, that when we fast, we would turn our eyes upon you, that we would uh, secretly do it, so that only you know Oh, Lord, we have so many things to pray about. Lord, you even said in your word to the disciples when they tried to cast out a demon that would not come out, that these kind only come out through fasting and prayer. It's because they, they were trying to do it in their own power, Lord, and we need to focus on you. You're the one who accomplishes everything in our lives. You are the vine and we are the branches. 
And if we remain in you and you in us, we will bear much fruit. That apart from you, we can do nothing. Help us to understand that, Lord. That apart from you, we can do nothing. Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful for this church that really wants to sit at your feet, to be like Mary. Help us to take some time, even one day this week, just take time to set our things down, to get away from the hustle and bustle of the world and focus on you. And speak to us through your word, Lord. Convict us of our sin. Bring repentance to our hearts. Bring love of you in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And friends, we look forward to this time when the resurrection will take place and the dead in Christ will rise and be together with the Lord forever. And so, we're going to sing an Easter song today, Christ Arose, hymn number 357. And even as we sing this, let's focus our hearts before the Lord. You know, sometimes, let me just say this one last thing, sometimes I think we sing and it's just a song. And, and it's, the lyrics are there, or the lyrics are here, and we're like, Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. We don't realize what we're actually saying, what the, what the lyrics actually are. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose! And because of that, we can have life. And because of that, we, we fast looking forward to the day when we will eat and drink with the Lord and never be hungry or thirsty ever again because Christ arose, because it's real, because it really happened in history. That's why we're here right now. If that did not happen in history, there's no reason to be in these pews. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our faith. That's the reason why Paul writes in Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, because if you don't believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then what are you doing? Then salvation uh, means nothing to you then. You will die in your sins if Christ is not risen from the dead. But he has risen from the dead. Even the uh, Apostle Paul, that one who was an enemy of Christ, that one who went to go and throw Christians into prison, he saw him with his eyes and he was changed. And he was willing to suffer anything for Jesus now because Jesus is alive. That's how he could wrote, write Romans 10. That's the reason why. Because he saw him. Because he realized it. The resurrection is real. It's true. It's historical. That's what we have to look forward to, friends. I'm 36. My boy right now is almost two months old. Two months old. Just went like that. How is it possible my son is two months old? He's already saying words like cat. <laughs> this time is flying so quickly by. Friends, we need to focus on Jesus because we're all going to be before him soon. And very soon we will be there. And we will look back like I was sitting in the pew yesterday with you. I remember that. I remember when you told me the resurrection is real. I remember when you said we have to fast. And I fasted that week on the Tuesday. And I focused on Jesus. It's, it was like yesterday that that happened. It was like yesterday and here I am. And I'm satisfied in Christ. Alive forevermore with him. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and sing together.